Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful we get to come into your house this day and celebrate Jesus. Lord, we pray that as we approach your word and open it up, that you open us up to receive it. Open up your word to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Holy Spirit, be welcome in this place. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, even the instruction, the correction we need for our lives, God. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all those around the world as well as in the Inland Empire that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord, and we love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in one field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. So, God, we'd ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters. Bless the Baptists and Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics. We thank you for the Pentecostals, God, for Calvary Chapel and Harvest, and Oak Valley for the Well and the Way, God, for Ecclesia and Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, God. All the great churches out there, too many to name, God. We thank you for the Foursquare and the Assemblies, God, uh, the great denominations that are out there, Lord, for the uh, Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, those that are naming Jesus as Lord, God. We bless them this day as you would bless us. For it's in Jesus' mighty name we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. amen. You can have a seat. Today, get your Bibles out and go with me once again to the wonderful text of Hebrews. We're in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Kind of neat just how the Holy Spirit leads us. I was thinking about it. Last time we were together in Hebrews, we were in the 10th chapter talking about obedience, how Jesus had a body that was prepared for him, and therefore he was prepared to do good works. And we as the body of Christ really should be prepared to walk in obedience. Now, last week when we were together, we took a sidestep from Hebrews, and yet there was still a vein of teaching when we talked about the potter's house and how God was molding our lives and shaping our lives and how we could continue to walk in obedience to the things of God. And really, that was a profound message last week when we got together. Today, once again, we're in the book of Hebrews, 10th chapter, and I believe the Holy Spirit is continuing our understanding. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And today, the title of the message is The Expectation of Christ. The Expectation of Christ. We'll find out what that means as we go along in the Word of the Lord together today. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, starting verse number 11, says this. It says, And every priest stands ministering daily, and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Verse number 12. But this man, notice the capital M speaking of Jesus. It says, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 13. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Now, let's go back to verse number 11 and take a look at this. The Word of God is starting to rehearse some of the concepts that we've already learned in the previous chapters. We talked about how we were going from the shadow to the substance. The shadow was the old, it was the law, it was the covenant that came first, and therefore it, it was giving us a picture of, of when Jesus would come and he would be the reality or the substance that we are to hold on to. And so it says in verse 11, every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Now think about the expectation of that priest. Every day of his life, every week of his life, every month of his life, every year of his life, he was going to continually be offering the same sacrifices day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. He, he, he really had a, a hope in the distant future, maybe in the near future, believing that God would send the Messiah someday, that, that somehow that God would take care of this problem called sin in his life. And so he never really got to finish that work. It was something that he would pass on from generation to generation. But then the next verse comes along, verse number 12, and says, But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. So what do we see Jesus as? We see Jesus as the sacrificial Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. He's the one who came and he bore the sins of the world, bore our sin past, present, and future on himself on the cross. He took the wrath of God upon himself. And now if we are in Christ Jesus, we are no longer children of wrath, but now we are children of God. But take a look at what it says, and he says, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Now, we've said this before, but it's worth saying again. No other priest had sat down in the presence of God. On the Day of Atonement, the priest could go into the presence of God there. But he could not go in without the blood, and therefore, after he had offered that blood, he never got to say, ah, oh, we're finished, it's done, good, now I can, I can take a rest and I can sit down here in the presence of God. No, he could never do that. He always had to go back out. Year after year after year after year. But Jesus, 
became the sacrificial lamb himself. And he died in our place, bearing the cross, bearing the shame, bearing the wrath of God on our behalf, taking our punishment on himself. But he didn't stay dead. He raised again to life. And now he has ascended into the very presence of Almighty God as our high priest. And he no longer stands ministering for the work of redemption. What did he say on the cross? It is finished. The work of redemption is done. There's no other sacrifice for sin that is necessary or needed. Once and for all, Jesus paid the price. Jesus purchased us out of our sin and our slavery. And now he has ascended to the right hand of God. And he is the only high priest who ever did this, sat down at the right hand of God. Now that's exciting. But take a look at the next verse, verse number 13. Look at this, from that time. From what time? From the time that he sat down. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Now when we think about a lamb, and when we think about a priest, we often don't think about somebody who has an enemy, Right? I don't think about priests gathering many enemies. No, the priests usually are the ones that the enemies are running to. Can you help me out, priest, right? The lamb. The lamb doesn't have that many enemies, even though the lamb was slaughtered. We don't really think in those terms. But now the Word of God is bringing a new concept, uh, bringing something now uh, a little different into play, because Jesus is not only our high priest. He's not only our sacrificial lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is also our king. And when you think about Jesus as king, seated at the right hand of God, he is the prince of peace, he is the king of kings and the lord of lords, Jesus there seated on his throne, now all of a sudden we think, well, kings have enemies. Kings go out to war, kings are rulers, and there are people that are opposed to the lordship and to the kingship of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we see this verse, and it's a very important verse. In fact, this is a quote from the Old Testament, Psalm 110. We'll go there in a minute, but for now, let me just uh, briefly tell you about some of the times this is used. Jesus himself quoted this verse. There's a time where the Pharisees and the religious leaders were coming at him and questioning him and questioning him and questioning him. And finally, Jesus is sick of it, so what does he do? He questions them. And he says, you guys are so smart. You guys are so cool. Tell me this then. If you guys know it all, let let me ask you a question now. And if you can answer me, that means you're cool and you're smart. But if you can't, get out of here. You bother me, kid, right? So what does he do? He says, if the Messiah is supposed to come from the line of David, how is it that David then calls him Lord? Because he says, my Lord said to my Lord, sit here on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And they were all stumped. They couldn't answer him. The, the great apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost when he preaches his famous sermon, what does he do? He starts talking about Jesus whom they crucified and then to prove he is Messiah, he says the same Jesus whom you crucified is now seated at the right hand of God waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. You'll find this verse all throughout the Bible. Now, as I was looking at this verse and thinking about what it means to our lives, the Spirit of God spoke to me and I took a look at that word waiting. Everybody see that word waiting up there? That word waiting is an interesting word. It doesn't mean waiting like, you know, you're, you're sitting there in a room and, and, you know, waiting for the doctor to come call your name, something like that. Really, it means expectation. Remember, the title of today's message is the expectation of Christ. It is confidently waiting for something. It, it's patiently waiting for something, knowing that you are going to receive. It's an expectancy. It's like when you ask, uh, you know, somebody, can, can, can you give this to me? And they say, yeah, I'll be right back. And they go and they get it. And you are waiting for them to bring that thing back to you. What are you doing? You are confidently expecting that they're going to go and deliver that object to you. That's the expectation that we're talking about. That's the waiting that we're talking about of Jesus. He's not sitting there on a hope or a dream or a whim. It really would be nice if this happened. No, he knows, he understands, he sees the future already, and he knows that there will be a time where God will say, son, it's time for you to go back to the earth, and he is sent back, and on that dreadful day, the Bible describes, it is great and awesome day. He's going to come back to the earth, and the the nations are going to be gathered against him. The devil and the false prophet and the beast and all that, you, you'll see that in the book of Revelation, the 19th, 20th, and 21st chapter, how God wraps it all up in the end. They're going to rally around Jesus, and they're going to try and make war against him, but he's going to speak, and with the breath of his mouth, the Bible says a sword will come out and will consume them. And all those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, they will be cast into the lake of fire. And then eventually the enemies of Christ called hell and called death, the last enemy to be destroyed, will be cast into the lake of fire as well. Then Jesus will take the kingdom and reconcile it and bring all those things back to his Father and put all things in subjection unto the Father that God may be all in all. 
Now that's a, a, a very broad stroke, that's a, a very brief overview of the end times, if you will. But listen to me. Doesn't matter if you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, no trib, trib this, trib that. What, what really matters is that we are ready with the expectation of Christ. Why? Because this will happen. This is going to take place. Jesus is coming back. This, you know, the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour, but we do understand the times and the seasons. And so Jesus said, when you see these things taking place, lift up your eyes because your redemption draws near. Church, we are in those days. And so it's very important that when we see the expectation of Christ, that we learn from it, that we draw from it, that we understand what it is that God is speaking to us. A couple of things for today I want to take a look at. The expectation of Christ. The expectation of Christ, number one, for today is based on the promise. The expectation of Christ, number one, is based on the promise. Psalms 110. Turn there with me, if you will. Psalms 110. I'm going to be in verse number one of Psalms 110. This is where we originally see this verse, first time that this is revealed to us. Psalm 110, verse number one, says these words. It says, the Lord said to my Lord. Now, I want you to look up on the overheads because I did something for you up there. Notice that it says the Lord, and I've highlighted in green there, said to my Lord, and that's also highlighted in green. Now, sometimes when we take a look at this, it looks like God is talking to himself. Essentially, yes, we could say that he is. But really, it's God the Father talking to God the Son. How do I know that? Because of the language that's used. If you look up the original language, it's the Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai. So this is God the Father, the covenant name of God, Yahweh, is speaking to Adonai, the coming Messiah. So the Lord said to my Lord, look at what he says, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So in other words, Jesus' expectation, the reason why he's sitting at the right hand of the Father expecting is because God had spoken a word to him. In the same way in our life, if we're going to have any sort of expectation of a future or have any hope in our life, it can't be based on a desire, on a whim, on a circumstance, or on a dream or something like that. It has to be based on the word of God. Amen. Our desire, our expectation cannot be based on anything else other than the Word of God. Why am I repeating myself? Because you've got to get a hold of this. Because if you base your life on anything else, that's shifting sand. It's going to fall over. It's not going to last. See, Jesus Christ is the eternal Word of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises are not changing. They're not moving with the shadows. No, He is the one. He is the eternal God. He's unshakable. He is immovable. He is the Almighty. He is strong, and He will hold you if you hold on to Him. And that's what this is all about. We must base our lives on the Word of God. See, sometimes we, we kind of hope, you know, I hope that God will bless me. I hope that God will take care of my needs. I hope that God will do this. I hope that, you know, the circumstances will work out this way. And yet God is saying, no, you can't just do that. You've got to get a hold of a promise. You've got to get a hold of what the Word of God has to say about you. That means you've got to get into the book and find out what it is that God says about you in your life. You want to prosper in life? Get a hold of the scriptures on prosperity. Find out that my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You want to be healthy in life. You want to be healed. Maybe you've been battling with sickness. God says, once you get in the word and find out what, that my word says, that by his stripes you were healed. See, that's a promise that you can stand on in your life. You, you want to not be confused and in chaos. And, you know, the Bible says that we do not have a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. The Bible says be at peace with all men and love one another. Walk in love. Walk in the spirit. See, these are all things. These are all promises. These are all things in the word of God that we can base our life on. And yet many people in church today come to church, hear the word of God, and then walk out of church and never apply the word of God. Never hold on to a promise. And wonder why they're not blessed. You're there in Psalms 110. Just stay there if you want or, or stick your finger in Psalm 110 or a you know, ribbon or something like that. Because we're going to go back to Psalm 110 in a moment. But I want to show you Romans chapter 8 verse number 37. Romans chapter 8 verse 37. We're talking about our lives being based on the promises of God. Romans chapter 8 verse number 37. In Romans 8 Paul's talking about famine and sword and nakedness and hunger and all this kind of stuff. The different circumstances, different things taking place in life. And in Romans 8, 37, he says, yet in all these things, what things? Famine and sword and nakedness, peril and all that kind of stuff. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors 
through him who loved us. In other words, it's not based on the outward things. This is based on him who loved us. Who is him? Jesus, the eternal word of God. He loves us. Therefore, we can be more than conquerors. Now you say, what does that mean, more than conqueror? See, you could be a conqueror, or you could be a more than conqueror. Yeah, you could get by in life, or you could be more than a conqueror. You know, the original language there in the Greek is uper. Really, we, we use it this way, hyper. You ever had a hyper kid? Right? Just annoyed you? Bouncing off the wall, swinging from the chandeliers, morning, noon, and night. You kind of got to slow them down so that they'll eat. And you're wondering if that's going to, you know, kind of calm them down because maybe they'll get food in their stomach. But then they go crazy, right? They even get more energy and they're running around and, you know, you're, you're, you're running around trying to get them tired out so that at night maybe they'll collapse in bed and fall asleep and give you some rest. See, that's the kind of life Christians should be living is that abundant, overwhelming life. We are not just conquerors. We're not just getting by. We are more more than conquerors, we're hyper conquerors in all things in life. We are just going after it, wreaking havoc on the devil's domain, taking authority according to the word of God, bringing those things into our life. I'm preaching way better than you're amen, and that's okay. That's okay. Say, Pastor, how, how do I do that, you know? How do I do that? Here's how. You get the promise. You declare the promise. You meditate on the promise. You remember it. You think about it. You bring it up. You talk to your wife about it, your husband about it. You tell your kids about it. You talk to family and coworkers. They tell you you're crazy. You say, watch and see. You continue to go on. You continue to believe God. You do what you can do in the natural. You believe God and you receive the promises of God. See, sometimes in life we wonder, why is life not working? Why, what's going on? And we have these questions. But when you get a hold of the word of God, now you have answers to life's questions. See, in this book, you can find the answers to everything. You say, well, why, God? Why? Why does it have to be that? Why, why is this going on in the world? Why is this taking place in my family? Why is this happening in my health? And God will answer your questions with the word of God. See, you may not get the why. You might get the who. His name is Jesus. See what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, you might get the why. Maybe sometimes you won't get the why, but you'll get the how. You know what I mean? Oh, I don't understand why I'm in this, but no, I know how I'm going to get out. See, you can have the answers to life's questions all throughout the Word based on the promises of God. Are you listening today? Expectation of Christ, number one, is based on the promise. Number two for today, when we take a look at Jesus seated at the right hand of God, waiting, expecting, what does that speak to us? Well, we see that it continues despite circumstances. The expectation of Christ continues despite Circumstances. You still got Psalm 110? Psalm 110, verse number 2. Look at what it says. It says, the Lord shall send out the rod of your strength out of Zion. Now, what is the rod of his strength? Really, when you think about a king, a king has a scepter, right? That scepter symbolizes his authority, his rule, and his reign, his power at work. So God says, I'm going to send out your authority, your rule, and your reign out of Zion. That was the place where Jesus Christ was seated. The true Zion is the heavenly place there that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Now look at what he says. Look at the rest of the verse. Rule where? In the midst of your enemies. In other words, when Jesus ascended on high and went and sat down at the right hand of God there, waiting till his enemies are made his footstools, is his enemies under his feet yet? It's okay to answer honestly today. When you look around the earth, do you see all of the enemies of God under his feet? No. Why do we know that? Because sin is still abounding in people's lives. Because death is still reigning on the earth. Because the powers and the principalities and the world's systems are swaying people. We see landmarks being moved in our nation. We see nations rising up. We see all sorts of circumstances that show us that Jesus is still waiting. Why? Because the enemy's not there yet. And even though that's happening, Jesus isn't sitting up there asking the Father, well, what's going on? I thought you said you were going to make all the enemies. Listen, I did my part. What's going on here? No, Jesus is confidently expecting, knowing that God will come through despite the circumstances here on the earth. Kind of a funny story. I heard of a reporter who was interviewing an old man on his 100th birthday. And he asked him, he said, what are you most proud of? And he says, well, uh, I guess the thing I'm most proud of is that I don't have an enemy in the world. And so the reporter says, well, what a beautiful thought that is. How inspirational. Yep, added the old man, outlived every one of them. <laughs> Church, if you're going through hell, 
Keep going. Hello? You don't camp out in the valley of the shadow of death. We go through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> Problems, trials, pressures, tribulations, it's all temporary stuff. It all has to bow its knee to the word of God in your life. So you may be believing for your, your health and you may still be sick. That's okay. Keep holding on. Keep believing. Keep moving forward. You might be believing God for prosperity and yet you just lost everything. That's okay. God will restore. God will build. God will bless. You might have said, God, I'm going to step out in faith and believe your word about tithing. And you started to tithe and all hell broke loose against your finances at that very moment. Anybody can say a, a, a weak little heartfelt amen. <laughs> but listen, hold on, because it's temporary. The promises of God will come to pass in your life if you don't give up, if you don't let up, if you don't get off. You've got to keep going. The reason why this church has been here for 26 years and will continue in the future is because we outlasted the problems of yesterday. That's, that's why. We just held on to God, and we just said, God, this is a problem, but Lord, we're just going to follow you. We're going to stay faithful. Stay faithful, church. Don't get off of God. Don't let a circumstances or a problem or a trial get you off of believing the word of the Lord. If Jesus can be seated on the throne, confidently expecting the word of the Lord to come to pass in the midst of all the chaos on earth, then what are we doing when we get off of the problem? Oh, no, that hurts too much, God. That's too much pain. That's too much trial. I can't do it, God. No, God says, hold on, church. Hold on to the promise. Keep going through the problem. Keep going through the trial. You can do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Romans chapter 5 this time. Romans chapter 5. You can turn there with me. Pop out of the Old Testament and the New Testament to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul is talking to the Roman church about Adam and how with Adam came sin. Adam came death. And we'll see that in a moment. Romans chapter 5 verse number 17. Romans chapter 5 verse 17. Take a look at it with me. It says this. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one. Now we know that when Adam was there in the garden. God told him you can eat of any of the trees. Except for the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. For the day you eat of it you shall surely do what? Die. Right? So he says for if by the one man's offense. Adam rebelling against God's rule and reign in his life. Look at what happened. Death reigned. The moment he ate of it. Spiritually he was separated from God. It was a sever. There was a schism. There was a division that took place. He spiritually died, and then later on in the natural, he physically died. You could say that at the moment he ate, the body started the process of death, deterioration. See, and all of us, until Jesus comes, we're going to experience that same thing. Why? Because through the one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Look at this, much more. Come on, somebody. Much more. Those who receive the abundance of grace, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it, and the gift of righteousness, that right position, that right will and way of God, look at this, will do what? Will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't say we'll reign and everything's going to be a bed of roses. It doesn't say we'll reign and nothing's going to be hard. It's all going to be easy. No, it says it's going to reign in what? Life. Life has its ups. Life has its down. But listen, you're going to reign right through the midst of your enemies, right in the midst of the trial, right in the midst of the problem. Why? Because God has given you abundance of grace. Notice that God doesn't just do a little dabble, do you? Just enough to get through the problem and you're exhausted at the end. No, he gives you the abundance. What is that? That is the overflow. That is the excessive amount. That is the more than enough. See, God says, I won't just get you through the trial. God says, I'm going to pour out an abundance of grace on your life so that you will be able to rule and reign in life through Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. You know what that brings to life? It brings stability. It brings stability. See, you don't have to waver with the world. You don't have to be tossed to and fro like a wind and wave of the sea, right? You, you can have stability. You can hold on. You can plant your feet on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, and you can make it through the storm. Can you say amen today? Amen. Last thing for today. The expectation of Christ, number one, is based on the promise. It gives us the answers we need. Number two, it continues despite the circumstances. It brings stability to life. Last thing for today. The expectation of Christ will be seen in the end. See, we haven't fully realized it yet, but there will come that day when the trumpet sounds, when Jesus comes and the eastern sky will split and he will come back for his own. We will meet him in the air. 
He will wipe out his enemies. They will all be destroyed and cast into the lake of fire. They will be under his feet. There will come a day, church, when God will settle all accounts in heaven and on earth. God will take care of us. The Bible says he will wipe away every tear from our eye. And we can lift up our eyes. We can be confident, expecting his return, being happy and excited. See, sometimes when we look to the future, when we start talking about end times, we start to get afraid and fearful. You know, it seems terrible. Why would God do that? What's he doing? But listen, as the church of Almighty God, the Bible says there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out all fear. See, we can have confidence on the day of his return because we know that we've given our heart and life to him and that he will take care of us, he will protect us, that we are not enemies of God, but since we have joined up with him and we're in covenant with him, he's on our side and we're on his side. And so when he comes back, he's coming to take us. He's coming to gather us to himself. He's now building his own house, and we're a part of that house. We have a place in the family of God. There's a mansion prepared for us. See, God's got good things ahead of us, and so we can be rejoice that God's expectation, Christ's expectation, there on the throne, will be seen in the end. You're there in Romans. Turn with me a book over to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Verse number 24 through verse number 26. Talking about the expectation of Christ will be seen in the end. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, verse number 24. Take a look at it with me. It says these words. It says, then comes the end. When he, speaking of Jesus, delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Look at verse 25. Quotes Psalm 110. For he must reign till he has put all enemies where? Under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. See, once that last enemy is destroyed, then Jesus puts everything back under subjection to the Father, that God may be all in all. That's what this is all about. What do we learn from this? We learn that God gives us the victory. That we, as we are linked up with God, will give us the victory. In fact, you're there in 1 Corinthians 15. Drop down to verse number 57 and verse number 58. Take a look at it with me. 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, verse number 57. Look at what it says. It says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, God hands you the victory. You say, well, pastor, does that mean that I don't have to do anything? Oh, no. You do your part. God does his part. You put in the natural, he puts in the super and makes it a supernatural experience. Let's take a look at the next verse, verse number 58. Verse number 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Notice that it's not the kickback, hang out of the Lord. It's not the chillax of the Lord, right? This is the work of the Lord. You do your part. You follow what you know to follow in the word of God. Keeping yourself holy. Keeping yourself in right standing with God. Doing the will of God the way of God. Offering your prayers and coming to church and telling somebody about Jesus. You put in your effort and God will give you the victory in life. Look at the rest of the verse. Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why? Because God is going to settle accounts one day. Even though you gave, even though you worked, even though there was people that hated on you and you had enemies here on the earth, God says, I will repay. You don't have to worry about it. Vengeance is mine. I'll take care of it. I will settle up at the end. I'm going to take care of your needs while you're here on the earth and on into eternity. Can you give the Lord a praise today? <laughs> Hallelujah. We have the victory. Now, if it can be said of Jesus, he's our example. He's the author and the finisher. He's our captain out in front saying, come on, you can do it. If he is the head, we are the body. So if it can be said of Jesus, then it can be said of us, our expectation. This is what we learned today. Not only Jesus' expectation, but our expectation, number one, is based on the promise. We have all the answers there in the word of God, get a hold of the promise of God. Secondly, our expectation continues despite circumstances. We can have stability in life. And finally, our expectation, number three, will be seen in the end. It's like it's already taken place because God said it and it is as good as done the moment that he said it. We just have to wait for it to come into reality here on the earth. If you got something for the word of the Lord today, come on, let's give God a great big praise in this place. I want you to examine yourself. The Bible says we should examine ourselves from time to time, see whether or not we're in the right spot with God. And I want you just to tune everything out for a moment, turn your phone off. 
okay? Just, just zero in on what God is speaking to your heart right now. You know, we talked about the end. We talked about the lake of fire and those that didn't have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Kind of a scary thought when you think about it. It's a fearful thing. But the Bible says we don't have to be afraid. We can know whether or not we're going to head for heaven or whether or not we're going to go to hell. God gives us that free will choice while we're here on the earth. And so just examine your heart. Where are you at with God? What if today was your last day on the earth? What if you died? God forbid that should happen to anybody in this room, but what if? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Now, sometimes people say, well, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. I, I, I think, you know, God's love and, you know, therefore, why would he do that? Well, listen, we just talked about it. It's in the Bible, Old and New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. And just by denying its existence doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to deal with the reality of it. Sometimes people say, well, yeah, I understand that. But, you know, all roads lead to heaven because God is love. And therefore, you know, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. And churches can do their thing. And everybody, as long as they stay true to themselves, you know, that means that we're going to get to go to heaven. Because all roads lead to heaven. You know, that's, that's really a foolish statement because when you think about it, here on the earth, it doesn't work like that, right? Not all roads lead to the moon. You can drive around the earth as long as you want. It'll never happen. In the same way, do you think that God created the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried out in his son Jesus, beaten bloody and hung on a cross? You think after he did all that, he would say, yeah, whatever you want to do or whatever they want to do, they, whatever they decide, as long as they stay true to themselves, that I'll let them in? No, he doesn't say that at all. Jesus said... I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. So what does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's good news because I know that if you're good enough, God will let you in heaven. I've been a really good person in my lifetime, been working on my resume for heaven, and I've done a lot of good deeds, helped people out, gave money to charities, got involved in social justice causes. I was raised in church, pastor, parents took me to church, told me we were Christians growing up. Uh, I was baptized or christened as a child. The parents hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Took you to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school. Catechism class. You know. Born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven, right? Not any other religions. Not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians. And, and, and you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here, I'm in church in front of you right now. My last church, in fact, I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. And got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did all that. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that just by being good, being raised in church, or by getting involved or attending, that you get to go to heaven? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible. Check it out. You can look. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that your good works will get you into heaven, or your merit, or your goodness, or your church attendance, or your church involvement will get you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And today, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. If that's how you think you're going to get there, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that our goodness compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags. That means they're going to get thrown out. The Bible records in Romans, the third chapter, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The standard is perfection, and no one is perfect except one. His name is Jesus. So you're not going to get there based on your merit. Not going to go to heaven just by being good or going to church, being raised in church, or getting involved. Got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, but wait a second, Pastor. I know God. I know about Jesus and, and celebrated Easter and the resurrection just recently. Sing the songs of Christmas every year of my life. I, I could even quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. I know who God is. That's great. I'm glad you know who God is. You know that most people in America know who God is, but most people in America are not going to go to heaven because of that. In fact, if you'd read your Bible, you know that demons know who Jesus is and believe he's the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. If you'd read your Bible, you know the devil himself knows who Jesus is and believes that he's the Son of God and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here. Look up at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head, having mental assent about who God is, knowing who he is and can quote some scriptures, celebrate a holiday. Rather, this is about your heart. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know we don't like that because we've seen that on movies and television, read about it on the internet or in a book. And it was weird. It was, it was not something that was desirable. But listen, let's not base our understanding off what society or the media says. Rather, let's base our understanding off what the Word of God has to say. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Because you're not going to get to heaven any other way but by being born again. That's Jesus' way from the Bible. So what does being born again mean? Well, it means the same thing from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end of the Bible. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. Just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. 
Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down. A little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Pop my hands together just like that. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that. Three. Bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hands, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's get over that embarrassment today. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet today, would you trade a moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. No one's that dumb. The devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to talk you out of it right now. Flesh is going to try and hold you back. Push past all that today. Let's go for God. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? Well, if you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God by acknowledging your need for Jesus in a moment, simply raising your hand. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or in the Love Rock Cafe, get ready to get your hand up and then tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. Even if you're online, God's watching wherever you're at all over the world. You can get right with God. Count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's, where are you at? There you at. Three, four. God bless you. Who else today? Five. Thank you up top. Thank you. Six. Thank you. Got you right here. Six. Anybody else real quick? Six wise people already on this side. Who else? Seven, eight. God bless you. Who else? Nine. Got you up there. Ten. Thank you. Who else today? Eleven on that side. Got you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's 11. There's 12 up top. Got you over there. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Anybody else today? You're saying, I wonder if I should. Listen, there's a dozen wise people already. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. And if you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, come on. Yeah, you should. Is there anybody else? Now, 12 wise people. We're at number 13. Come on. Let's go for God today. Who else today? Saying, yeah, I need to give God all my heart. I need to give God all my life. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'll give you one opportunity. One more time. Last call. I'm going to sweep through. And as I do, if that's you, just get ready to get your hand up when I'm looking in your direction. Let's go for it today. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else over here? Anybody else up top? Over in this section? Come on. Come on if that's you up top. Anybody else? Anybody else on this side? Thank you, 13. Come on, who else today? Number 14. Where are you at? Thank you, 14. Come on, don't you know there's 15 sitting there? 15. God bless you. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Hallelujah. All right, now all 15 of you, or the other five that should have raised your hand but you didn't, okay? Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all gonna stand, give a clap and a shout. That's your cue. Get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, co purse, sweater, Bible, friend of you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're gonna change destinies today, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So that's you, you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. You get your stuff, get a friend of you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now, come on down, come on down. Come on, come on, come on. Get your stuff, get your friend. If you need a friend, get in the alley. Meet me up front right now. You can come too. From the family room, bring your children. From the foyer, come on. Come on, come on, come on. You can come too. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. today you need to come just come on down they're still coming come on let's give them a hand as they come come on come on come on 
Anybody else if you need to come, just make it right to the front right now. Come on. Come on down. They're still coming as they come, as they come. Let me, let me give you guys some direction here. Everybody up front, first of all, put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. You came to give God all of your heart, came to give God all of your life, right? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. See this guy over here waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy, okay? Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you already got past this, okay? So now he's cool, okay? He's going to do three things with you. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Then he's going to give you, number two, some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God. It's easy reading, okay? It's free. So take hold of that and find out what to do next, okay? Then finally, he's going to introduce you to a program we have here in the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Basically, it's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out. Now listen, listen, listen. I want to make a promise to you guys, okay? Give us one year of your life here at The Rock, sitting consistently under the Word of God. Get back to church as often as you can. We have 11 church services a week. Pick two, pick three, pick five. I don't know. Get into as much as you can consistently under the Word of God. One year of your life here at The Rock. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, I guarantee you will look at your life and say, man, I did not know it could be like this. I am so blessed. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Take their word for it. You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.